Welcome to Tools for Making Your Library Space Welcoming and Accessible. My name is Angela Myers, and I'm with the Bridges Library System located in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And I am joined by Leah Langby, who is the Library Development and Youth Services Coordinator with the IFLIS Library System in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for, for joining us today for this webinar. We have several things on our agenda today, and those four main topics include why making your library accessible matters, tools you can use, considerations for remodeling or building a new library, and resources for further learning. Let's start off with why making your library accessible matters. First of all, Making your, access, your library accessible matters because it's the law. Accessibility standards under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA apply to places of public accommodation, commercial facilities, and state and local government facilities. This includes new construction, alterations, and additions. Public libraries fall under Title II of the ADA, which applies to municipal and state-funded libraries. Title II of the ADA requires state and local governments to give people with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from their programs, services, and activities. Why should your library be accessible? Because it's the right thing to do. It aligns with the key public library values. Individuals with disabilities should be able to use and access all the same services and materials in the library as their non-disabled peers, either through alternative means or with assistance. This goes for everyone in the community. Identity or life experience should not be a barrier to access, and it is core to the library mission to provide access for everyone. Your decisions impact your library's accessibility in a number of areas, including collections, technology offerings, physical spaces, and your online presence. And another reason why you should make your library accessible is because it's good for everyone. When libraries honor the full diversity of their communities, communities thrive. This statement comes from the Wisconsin Public Library, Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction's Inclusive Services Statement. Accessible and inclusive design benefits many people. Some examples include single cell bathrooms. Many of the libraries within my library system host memory cafes, which are for individuals living with memory loss along with their care partners. Many persons attend with a husband or wife or adult child. A single stall restroom is ideal. However, libraries can put a sign on a door that reads something along the lines of, Sorry for the inconvenience, but this bathroom is temporarily unavailable, and this allows a male-female pair to use a single-sex restroom. Automatic door openers. The first automatic door was designed by engineers Horace H. Raymond and Sheldon S. Roby in 1931. The invention was to help waiters carrying plates and glasses at the Wilcox Pier restaurant in West Haven, Connecticut. How often do you use an automatic door? Every time I enter a grocery store, a drug store, or a medical clinic, a door opens for me. This is a modern convenience for me, but it's imperative for individuals with mobility differences. Lighting. We have many different lighting options throughout our homes, perhaps with more lighting in the kitchen and bathroom compared to bedrooms or the living room. The library will have different lighting needs as well. You will want to take into consideration lighting for book stacks, lighting in your general reading areas and staff areas, and exterior lighting. Good architectural design takes into account glare control, spatial definition, orientation, and variety. Amplification and sound systems. Libraries that hold public programs should be using amplification or a sound system. Larger libraries will often have a built-in sound system, but these are only effective if the presenter is using a microphone and that you are encouraging your audience members to use a microphone as well. Smaller libraries or libraries that take their programs outside or off-site can use a portable sound system. 
Portable sound systems can be purchased for as little as $150 and be perfectly suitable for outdoor story time or up to a few hundred dollars for larger systems that come with Bluetooth microphones. And quiet rooms. A quiet or comfort room can be a per permanent or temporary space for people to use to get away from a noisy environment or to use as a lactation room. If your library does not have a space for a permanent quiet room, consider carving out a space that could be used for a quiet space during heavy program times or that could be requested as needed. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Leah, now. Okay, um, so Angela and I wanted to talk with you about some of the tools you can use to help you with making your spaces more accessible and inclusive. So we're gonna start with the inclusive services statement, uh, which Angela referred to earlier. It was updated in 2019 by the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction uh, with input from public library system staff. And it's a great touchstone if you're trying to share information or get inspired about why all of this is important. The whole statement gives examples, context, and reasons, but this quote sums up a lot of the point of the statement. A person's race, ethnicity, age, citizenship, literacy level, ability, family structure, income level, health status, gender identity, sexuality, style of dress, familiarity with public libraries, or any other dimension of identity should neither negatively influence nor interfere with access to libraries. So in 2019, the State Library were, yep, the State Library brought together a small group of library workers from across the state to talk about ways um, to help libraries bring the inclusive services statement to life. The result was the Inclusive Services Assessment and Guide for Wisconsin Public Libraries. This resource is available on the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction website, and you can find a link on the resources slide that Angela will talk about at the end of this webinar. The assessment and guide includes introductory information and then a list of considerations to which you can answer yes, no, in progress, or not applicable. The considerations cover everything from governance to policies to staffing to collections to programs and to community engagement and the longest section of the guide is called where the interactions take place which goes to show you that the physical space has a lot to do with the way that people are able to access the resources of the public library if you're looking for ways to make your library more accessible and inclusive either through a new or remodeled space or through smaller adjustments you can make, this guide is a good place to look for help. There are so many questions in this guide and it's important um, and there are a lot of important things to consider. It can be a little overwhelming, so we thought it might be helpful to remind you of a few things. First, remember that this guide is meant as a tool for reflection and conversation. It is not a rule book. Um, and it is helpful to remember that there's no library in Wisconsin that could mark yes on every single consideration in this document. So you're not a failure if you have, um, if you can't do that. The goal of the assessment and guide is that it gives library directors, staff, and trustees a framework to evaluate where they are and set goals on where they want to be. You don't have to do it all at once. And in fact, it makes a lot of sense to break it down into smaller pieces, especially if you're in a small library with limited staff and financial resources. No matter where you are, you will need to prioritize what to work on first based on your capacity and also on the needs of your community. And no matter where you are, you can use this guide over and over again to continually assess where you are with regard to the recommendations. It when back I over first here. looked through my uh, through the inclusive services assessment and guide for Wisconsin public libraries, I was really impressed by the breadth and the depth of this guide. It includes four main sections, um, as Leah had mentioned, and within those sections, there are actually 321 question statements. So that means there's 321 things that you need to check into. 
So it is quite a large guide um, and it can take um, some time to get through. So as I listened to how my colleagues around the state were approaching the guide, one idea stuck out to me and that was to work in a cohort or a group. And so what I did is I um, decided that I wanted to meet regularly with my libraries within the system to tackle this guide section by section. I set up an opportunity for our libraries to join what I called the Inclusive Services Assessment and Guide, ISIG for short, cohort in 2021. At our first meeting, I went over the main sections of the guide and the cohort of about eight libraries talked about how they would like to approach the guide. We decided as a group that we would meet monthly on the same day and time of the month. And at that time, it was a Monday at one o'clock for six months as we worked towards um, the work our way through the guide. And the idea was to work through it one section at a time independently, but then come together to discuss questions that were raised and to cl clarify the checklist statements in the guide. Um, it was also um, used as a time for our libraries to talk about the different checklist statements and, and made plans towards progress of the checklist statements. As a first step, several of the libraries took the one page inclusive services statement developed by the same folks that developed the guide and brought that to their board of directors for review and discussion. This was a great starting point as it set the stage for future conversations about inclusivity and access. The first section of the guide that the group decided to tackle was who is responsible. This section of the guide includes governance, administration, and staffing. The group chose to review this section first as there was a good chance that this section would take the longest to get through and would possibly require checking in with the most people. The section where interactions take place, which includes the physical facility and access, had a lengthy list of checklist statements, so this section was split into two meetings, giving the libraries time to work through the guide thoughtfully and completely. In between meetings, libraries would communicate with each other via listserv that was set up for the specific cohort. Often it was used to follow up on meeting topics. During the meeting where we discussed facilities and specifically indoor spaces, one library was asking for help to brainstorm, brainstorm ideas on how to bring power to the center of her library because that's where most of her study tables were located and that's where people tended to congregate. They were told it would be in, very expensive to add power to the center of the building due to the building materials used to construct their library. As a follow-up, another library in the cohort took a picture of their drop-down power outlets in their makerspace and shared the picture via the listserv as a possible solution to bring power outlets to the center of the library. So this just goes to show you how powerful working in a cohort can be. In the end, we had six libraries stay the course of the six-month cohort. The group enjoyed the process and the accountability to each other. They also commented that the discussions that would come up as a result of going through the guide with their coworkers in their actual in their physical library was quite valuable. So moving on um, to another topic or another tool that we wanted to introduce to you are accessibility scans. So starting in 2018, I worked with my local independent living center called Independence First and Society's Assets to provide accessibility scans for our member libraries. Specifically, I worked with the staff members um, from the independent living centers who had undergone ADA coordinator training. These accessibility scans or audits were paid for and coordinated by our library system. The staff member from the Independent Living Center would visit the library and go about the scan on their own, taking pictures and measurements along the way. Some scans would take a few hours and others up to eight hours. It all depends on the size of the library, if the library underwent any renovations or additions, how many restrooms there were, and the age of the building. The PDF reports that were generated from the accessibility scans include a picture of the barrier, a text description of the barrier, which section of the 2010 ADA standards it related to, and any recommendations. Pictured here on the slide is Brian from Independence First. 
which is one of our independent living centers and is located in Milwaukee. In this photo, Brian is measuring the slope of a sidewalk and marking down the measurements outside the library in the parking lot. Independence First used the ADA existing facilities checklist from the New England ADA Center as a guide, which is freely available for anyone to use and is referenced in our resource list at the end of this slide deck. The 2010 Department of Justice ADA standards for accessible design guidelines were also used. The goal of the accessibility scans is to provide information to the public libraries on their compliance with ADA it is information that can be used to help in correcting the inexpensive or easy items or budgeting for the more expensive and lengthier projects. I will note that a number of the member libraries that received a written accessibility scan also participated in the inclusive services and assessment guide cohort. There is some overlap with the physical elements of the building, which is what the accessibility scan covers but the guide covers other elements like policies and protocols, collections and programs, and website and online catalog considerations. So with nearly 20 accessibility scans complete within the Bridges Library system, I've seen a lot of barriers mentioned over and over. Some of them were common and inexpensive to remedy, including tacking down loose rugs, Lee and I talked a lot about loose rugs, as we think almost every single one of our libraries who underwent an accessibility scan had a loose rug. So oftentimes rugs become curled on the edges from wear and tear, and that rugs that are rented can often shrink from going through the dryer cycle. So if your library is renting rugs and they are not laying flat, I highly suggest that you advocate for different rugs because that is not access acceptable or accessible. If your library owns its own rugs and they're curling on the edges, tack them down or replace them. These are big tripping hazards and it's a simple and inexpensive fix. Placement of accessibility signage. Oftentimes libraries will have the correct signage, but it'll be hung at the incorrect height or in the wrong spot altogether. Oftentimes I've seen permanent room signage lacking required elements, which include braille, raised uppercase letters, and contrasting sans serif letters on a non-glare finish. Pictured on the screen is a sign outdoors that points to a step-free route. It's a great idea to provide temporary or permanent signage, depending on the situation, to let people know where the accessible route is. If your library has a front and back entrance, but the back entrance has an accessible route, be sure to place a permanent sign out front indicating that the accessible route is around back. Nothing's worse than getting out of the car after, you know, getting on your feet and whatnot and finding out that you can't enter the building. So please put a sign out front that that entrance is in the back. Check for furniture blocking aisles. Oftentimes, furniture gets moved over time by staff and, of course, by patrons. So be sure that your furniture, inc including step stools, are not blocking aisles. Check for placement of coat hooks. This was another item that was in almost every one of our accessibility scans. And this is a simple one that we spotted in many restroom stalls as well as in community rooms because we often um, put those hooks in the community room um, for winter time when we want to um, have a space for people to hang up their jackets. The top of the hook should be placed at a maximum of 48 inches above the floor. Make sure that your pipes under the bathroom sinks are insulated. Pipes underneath bathroom sinks need to be insulated so that individuals using a wheelchair don't burn their legs on hot water pipes under the sink. Exposed sink pipes need to be wrapped with insulation. This is an easy and inexpensive fix. And check and adjust door weights, resistance, and speed. The closing force of an interior door should be no more than five pounds. Door closers should be adjusted so that from a position of 90 degrees, the time required to move the door to a position of 12 degrees from the latch is just five seconds. You might be wondering how a person measures door force. There's a force gauge that you can purchase that will measure the push and pull force of your doors for about $50. 
It's important to note that door force should be checked in the fall and the spring as the weather affects the air pressure in your building, therefore affecting the force needed to close doors. I'm gonna turn it back over to Leah. Alrighty, so um, we did some scans in the IFLIS area as well. And uh, it's amazing how much commonality there was between the libraries in the southeast part of our state and the libraries in the more northern and western part of the state. Um, and some of those um, issues were, as Angela said, a little easier to fix. And some of them were are things that are a little more complicated to fix. Um, so um, a lot of these included things that are in the parking lot and sidewalk. That includes slopes in the parking lot that are too steep or cracks in the sidewalk and parking lot that make it hard for a person with a wheelchair or walker to navigate. Also curb cuts and entrance ramps that are not sloped properly. This is expensive to fix and usually also involves your municipality because they're the ones with the jurisdiction over these areas. It's also important to fix because it's if people can't get into your building, then that is um, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> it kind of stops stops everything. Um, also, automatic doors, although not absolutely required by the Americans with Disability Act, automatic door openers help everyone, as Angela mentioned, and are extremely important for people with mobility issues and their ability to access your building independently. Um, perhaps a little more manageable, uh, the heights of things like countertops, grab bars in the bathroom, and service and computer desks, book drop openings, those heights often need to be adjusted. And sometimes that's a little bit more of a simple fix. It's not quite as easy as tacking down a rug, but it is, um, it's a little, it's a little more manageable. All right. So beyond the Americans with Disability Act, there are some things that you'll want to consider um, that aren't going to be considered that aren't going to be covered in those accessibility scans, but you will find more information about them in the inclusive services assessment and guide. Um, I'm going to give you a few to consider. One is just making your book return accessible 24 seven. There are a lot of libraries that um, don't do that, but it sure makes it easier for people with different or very busy schedules to get things back in a timely fashion. Um, add an accessibility statement to your publicity. Be sure to add a specific contact person and the date by which you need people to request accommodations, usually a week ahead of time. So that gives you time to line up and it, uh, a sign language interpreter or whatever other accommodations the person needs to participate. You can also make some temporary fixes to accommodate different needs. Um, and Angela kind of talked about some of these already, but I'm going to, they bear repeating. So I'm going to talk about them again. Um, even if you don't have the ability to make permanent changes, for instance, you can create quiet corners or areas for people who might need time to regroup. You can carve that out of your existing space, or you can also just create a, a temporary space during programs. Um, one library in Southern Wisconsin um, that Angela works with makes their boardroom that's across the hall from their programming room available for people who need to decompress during their memory cafe programs. Some libraries have a tent or something like that that they put up in their story time room so that kids who get overstimulated have a quieter and calmer place to retreat for a while. Um, Angela talked about the value of single stall restrooms, um, and there are a lot of different kinds of people um, and situations for which single stall restrooms are, val are really important and valuable, inclu including um, caregivers who need um, to get in and assist someone, but also um, of any age, but also um, uh, people who have um, are not gen are gender nonconforming. Um, they often are or feel safer if they're in a single stall restroom. So those are some um, other and some people just really prefer having a single stall restroom because it's more private and for various other medical reasons it's it's preferable to be able to have a private space. Um, 
if you don't have one and it isn't feasible to install one right right now, you can make one of your multi stall bathrooms available for single users as Angela mentioned so you can just put a sign in the door to make that multi stall bathroom into a single stall restroom if needed. Um, there are a few things that cost a little money, but are relatively simple and inexpensive, and they include taking a look at your wayfinding signs for readability and approachability. If you have a lot of people in your community whose first language is not English, reflect that in your signs. Also include pictograms to make it more universal and readable for people who are not fluent readers. Consider putting in a drive up book return and or book returns in locations like the grocery store. Um, make sure that you have changing tables for children in multiple bathrooms and also consider adding adult changing stations as well. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a little while. And also, as Angela mentioned, acquire a portable sound system and require presenters to use that microphone during programs. That's good for everyone, but especially people with hearing loss, even if it's untreated or undiagnosed. Okay. So once you get the, an accessibility scan, if you're able to do that, or um, you use the inclusive services and guide, how do you get buy-in for addressing the issues that you find? Well, first of all, um, making sure that your board knows that you're exploring these issues and asking the board members for help can be a really good first step. If that board is resistant to getting an accessibility scan or embarking on this work, make sure that they understand that the information from the, uh, the assessment and guide or the accessibility scan is really meant for your own planning no one's reporting you to the police for issues of non-compliance with the ADA as a result of these audits or evaluations. It's also important to remember that once you know about the compliance issues, that doesn't make you more liable for them if someone complains. If you're out of compliance, someone can make a complaint whether you know about the issues ahead of time or not. And if you know about them, you can have a plan for how you're going to address them. And that can be easier than being caught blind, blindsided. Okay. Once you have some of those results, present them to the board along with some ideas about things you'd like to start addressing um, and how. Uh, provide a copy of the barriers to the, your village board or city council, again, along with a plan about how you will address these issues and um, include those things in your budget each year. Um, also, you can work with partners to help you make the case, help you look for funding um, and other resources, and help you make, help you reach the audiences that might have the most to lose if the library doesn't make some of these changes. For instance, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, Centers for Independent Living, the school district, there are a lot more that you could consider working with. Also, build a culture of accessibility and inclusion. Make sure that you're consistently making the case for why this fits with the library's mission and values. Also, uh, if you can talk the language of the people you're speaking with, um, sometimes safety concerns are easier for them to relate to. So don't be afraid to um, bring that up, that someone could get hurt and the city could get sued. That can be a big motivator for people to, to take a closer look at what you're what you're proposing. Okay, some of you are lucky enough to be embarking on a building or a major remodeling effort. Angela and I talked with a few library directors or project managers that recently went through a building project about what they learned in terms of accessibility and inclusion. Here are a few things they said that either they were glad they did or they wished they had known earlier. The first one is setting your fundraising goal high enough to include accessibility or inclusion features from the outset. I know it can be hard to balance all the things you and your community want in a library with your fundraising abilities, but if you can raise enough money to do some of these things at the outset, it will save you time and money later, and it's important to prioritize access. Acoustics plus installing hearing loops and sound systems. Um, are, those are things that are a lot easier to, to 
think about in the planning stages and in the construction rather than adding them afterwards. Um, put door openers on from the beginning. And if you're going to do a renovation and this means replacing the doors in order to make those door openers effective or workable, um, try to make sure that you include that in your original plans. Here's a good one. When you're choosing furniture, Take people of varying sizes, shapes, and needs to try the lounge furniture so there's more likely to be something for everyone. And along the lines of furniture, make sure the furniture for your meeting rooms is easy for staff and the public to move. Even if they look nice, 40 pound tables do not add to the accessibility or flexibility of your meeting and program rooms. Make sure that you have well-marked parking and make it clear where the accessible parking is located, as Angela was saying. If your accessible parking is in the back of the building, um, make sure that you include excellent wayfinding to that parking from the street in the initial design of your building, not a tacked on thing after the fact. Speaking of parking, Consider including space either into or out for strollers, skateboards, bicycles, and possibly other belongings, um, particularly thinking of unhoused people who need a place to keep their possessions while they're using the library. Um, everyone recommended that although the Americans with Disability Act um, only requires a 36 inches between shelves, um, they recommended building in enough space to have aisles of at least 42 inches, which is what the ADA actually recommends. Um, it's much easier and better for all users, staff and public alike. And there were a few people that pointed out that lower shelving has multiple benefits. It provides better sight lines, um, creates a more open feeling, plus it's easier to reach for kids, people in wheelchairs, or little people. Okay. On to the next one. Um, so having at least one single stall, all gender accessible restroom for the for all the reasons we talked about before, plus probably some other ones. Um, and then consider automatic door openers for your restrooms. There were a few libraries um, that did recent building projects that uh, wish they had more automatic door openers for restrooms. Um, and then making sure that you have changing tables for children in multiple restrooms and consider changing tables for adults. Last month, Minnesota passed a law that all large new public buildings will be required to have an adult changing table. So it does seem to be a wave of, a wave of the future as a way for people with disabilities to have access to the restroom facilities they need and the dignity they deserve. One caveat is that I talked to one urban library that has a significant number of people with substance use disorders that use the library. The library has unfortunately seen quite a few overdoses and drug deals in those single stall restrooms. The project coordinator for the building project suggested paying close attention to how the library staff can enter the restrooms and create a plan for how to monitor them. She did not regret having the single stall restrooms. They're very popular and important to have, she felt. Um, but she, uh, she did say, you know, you really have to be paying attention to them, depending on your circumstances. Um, in this library also, they put in an adult changing table, um, and there ha they have found that in their circumstance, there have been a lot of unsanctioned activities happening with that adult changing table, so many that they are regretfully pulling it out next month. Um, libraries in locations where these problems are less severe have been adding adult changing tables without this kind of trouble, and as I said, there are very compelling reasons to add them. Angela talked about comfort rooms, also a really great thing to consider, a room that's available for people who need to take a break from the stimulus of the library or a private space for nursing, a child, or various other things. And as she mentioned, a temporary comfort room is also an option. So even if you don't have a budget or space in a renovation to have an entire comfort room that that's its only job, consider making plans for another small room like a study room that can be used as a comfort room as needed. You might want to make some adjustments to the way this room is set up um, to accommodate a dual purpose. So those are nice to consider ahead of time. All right, then 
uh, Angela and I also got some tips from people about communicating with architects, designers, and contractors. This is not only extremely useful for keeping accessibility front of mind, but it's also extremely useful for your project as a whole. Um, so several mentioned that you need to find a really clear line of communication between the library's product project manager on the library side and the team, either the architect, designer, or contractor. Make sure the library staff in charge of the project is copied on all the emails with information and decisions about the project. Sometimes they'll forget and you just have to gently remind them. In weekly meetings with a contractor, make sure that the Americans with Disability Act and other inclusion priorities are covered regularly, not just one and done. We tend to trust the contractors to be keeping ADA compliance in mind, along with all the other building codes, but sometimes they aren't as on top of this as we might think. So, for example, don't assume your contractor is keeping track of the steepness of the slopes in your curb cuts and parking lot and accessible spaces, even though they should be. Even in newer building projects, this is one of the most common areas of concern, and it's much easier to get it right the first time than to correct it later. Take time to make your decisions. Timeline pressure is real, but it's okay to take some time to do research and ask for staff and other stakeholder opinions. Listen to the expertise of the architects and designers and contractors, but expect them to listen to your expertise about the library as well. Sometimes architects and designers have very interesting aesthetic ideas that are just not workable in your library environment. Some examples that I've heard about, um, a display for books that's beautiful, but very tall and spindly and easy to knock over, or wheels on the bottom of the, um, on the, bottom of the ottomans in the children's room. Um, those of you who work in a children's room can immediately imagine why that might not be a great plan. Um, I also was in a library once where the um, architect thought it would be interesting for the story time room to be womb-like, which meant that the, um, built, that the room was super dark and had really odd lighting and hard for um, people to see what was going on. They couldn't see the the pictures in the books or see what the people each other were doing. So they had to come up with all sorts of workarounds. So don't be afraid to stand up for what you know is important for your users and your staff. Try to be flexible to change things as needed when you find they need to be adjusted to work in your situation. Um, so once it's built, if you find that something's not working, um, give it a chance, but then don't be afraid to make some changes to make them work. And those are the sage pieces of advice from your colleagues who have gone through this experience recently. Thank you, Leah. And now we'll move on to some resources for further learning. So we've compiled a list of kind of our top resources for you. We didn't want to overwhelm you, but we wanted to give you some of our favorites. Um, and they include the Great Lakes ADA. Um, it's a technical assistance center for the Great Lakes area. So that includes Wisconsin. The Great Lakes ADA Center is a member of the ADA National Network. And they staff a toll-free information line providing informal guidance on the Americans with Disabilities Act and accessible information technology. I have called the Great Lakes ADA Center myself um, for various things, and they've always been very helpful to me. The um, ADA Technical Assistance Program is operated by the Department of Justice, and they also operate a toll-free ADA information line to provide information and publications for the public about the requirements of the ADA. Um, also on here is the ADA Checklist for Existing Facilities from the New England ADA Center, which was referenced earlier. Uh, local Center for Independent Living. Um, that link will take you to all of the different locations throughout Wisconsin that you could contact to um, ask about getting an accessibility scan um, at your library, and they will be able to tell you what the fee for that service would be depending on the size of your library, the construction material, when it was built, how many restrooms they'll be evaluating, so on and so forth. 
And also the link here is for the inclusive services and assessment guide uh, of which Leah and I have both touched on quite a bit in this uh, webinar that is free for you to use. And like we said multiple times, you can take it at your own pace, uh, do a little bit at a time or work with a group of people um, that are in your library or across libraries um, to work your way through that guide. We also have some further learning opportunities um, Project Enable is a free foundational training designed specifically for the public, academic, or school librarians to help them gain knowledge and skills needed to create inclusive and accessible libraries. You can sign up for that free of charge. If you're looking for in-person or virtual learning opportunities related to accessibility, I highly encourage you to look at Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability called the LEAD Conference, and it's held um, annually, typically in summer. And it's a group of cultural institutions um, that get together and talk about accessibility. So uh, even though you might be one of the only public libraries uh, represented, um, many of the topics will be very applicable to you as a librarian. And also the National ADA Symposium, which was just held uh, last month, but they do have an upcoming virtual version of their um, conference coming up soon. So your presenters today, again, Leah Langby with the IFLIS Library System, and then myself, Angela Myers, uh, with Bridges Library System. We are both available if you have questions about how to get an accessibility scan for your library, um, maybe how to get the buy-in for that, how to get started with the um, inclusive services assessment and guide, that sort of thing. And last but not least, we would like to thank you for your time today, and we encourage you to go fix a rug. Easy first step, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. And this picture on this slide is a, a photo that was taken from one of our accessibility scans uh, with red circles highlighting the curled edges of a rug. So, Go fix a rug and you'll get one thing done off of your accessibility checklist right away. And with that, we'd like to thank the sponsors of this uh, building um, and spaces webinar series, which is Wisconsin Public Library Systems Institute of Museum and Library Services, Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, and of course, the whole library building and spaces group uh, that they're putting this on for us. So. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone.